time, we'll take up H4094, known as JC's Law. And uh, who is our first uh, representative? Huggins, are you going to speak to that? All right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, uh, ladies and gentlemen of subcommittee, I certainly appreciate the time. And um, I'm going to be brief so that we can yield to the folks that are, that are going to be a lot more uh, in depth than, than I. But um, 4094 um, is certainly uh, JC's law. Uh, that's what we've named it. Uh, JC was a young man. You have a, a article that I think Ms. Dean has passed around uh, that sort of tells a little bit about that in January that occurred in Hampton County. Um, where he was uh, killed by a pit bull. And I think his mom is actually with us, and we certainly appreciate her and, and, and all our, our sympathy and empathy go out to her for, for her loss. Um, what the bill does, just briefly, um, is it is in requiring registration for fertile pit bulls. It's not required for altered pit bulls. $25 fee. Uh, there is determination of whether you qualify for the $25 fee or not. Some folks that have pit bulls don't even have a full-bred pit bull, so there's determination needed there. Um, there's allowance of fertile pit bulls and exemptions. Um, it's certainly not picking on the breed. It still allows for breeding, and I know there's a lot of discussions going on with it now, but like I said, I'm going to yield my time, Mr. Chairman, um, to the folks that are here to testify today and would appreciate them being able to talk today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Representative Huggins. Um, First person we have signed up to testify is Joe Elmore from the Charleston Animal Society. Mr. Elmore, your mic is on. We're ready for you. Thank you, Chairman McCravey. Joe Elmore, President and CEO of Charleston Animal Society, Charles, North Charleston, South Carolina. I'm also a resident of there, um, raised in Greenville, South Carolina. My family's in Greenville, South Carolina. And I'll, um, <clears throat> thank you, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, and members of the committee and Chair and <clears throat> Representative Huggins for introducing 404094. <clears throat> Just briefly, I want to say this bill is all about saving the pit bull type of dog in South Carolina. This is my pit bull of 12 years. Um, for the Carolina and Clemson fans, I apologize. This is game day. Um, had him for 12 years. He was a great dog, a majestic dog. Uh, died in my arms of a brain aneurysm. On behalf of the over 18,000 current members of Charleston Animal Society and our network of animal shelter partners across our state, I ask you to pass this bill out of subcommittee to be heard by the full House Judiciary Committee. 4094 is referred to as Jace's Law. In memory of a six-year-old boy mauled to death by a fertile, unaltered pit bull type of dog in Hampton County this year. Jace's mother, you'll hear from her shortly. Please vote yes. Take the vote today. Send this to the full committee. We have worked on this bill for about two years, compromised over and over again. We've had a number of discussions with Representative Hyatt out of Pickens County, chair of the Agriculture Committee, as you know, <clears throat> to improve the bill. It works. It works in Beaufort. It works in Aiken. It works in South Carolina. You will hear from those leaders there. That's why those of us working on the front lines, actually running animal shelters from Charleston to Monk's Corner to Somerville to Greenwood. All of them support this bill. I spoke with them this morning on the way up here. Berkeley County, Dorchester County, Greenwood County. <clears throat> we spent countless funds on community outreach, and we still do, but it's just not enough to save these dogs. We need your help. This is about South Carolina families and South Carolina dogs, our pit bull types of dogs. I'm saddened that I'm here again. Ten years ago, I was here representing the ASBCA. I was here in South Carolina, shortly following the death of Ethel May Horton. <clears throat> I provided testimony about that death. It was a horrific death. 
I'm not going to go into the details out of deference to Jace's mother. She was a, but she was an elderly African-American woman. <clears throat> Jace, as you know, young, white child. This affects men, women, children, black, white, elderly. It affects all of us South Carolinians. It affects our families. The most pressing issue for animal shelters and costing millions of dollars each year in taxpayer dollars and in donor dollars is the disproportionately large number of pit bull types of dogs due to a lack of accessible and affordable spay and neuter and awareness of the dangers they face and the dangers that our families face by circumstances that place this majestic dog through no fault of its own in situations where it is harmed, euthanized, or it causes harm. The problem, and these are the facts, these are South Carolina facts, this is South Carolina data. Pitbull type dogs are the most prevalent dogs entering South Carolina shelters. <clears throat> in 2018, nine participating animal shelters indicated that upward of 20,000 dogs entered their shelters that year. Almost 6,000 or 30% were pit bull types of dogs. Right now, at our shelter in Charleston County, we have 98 dogs in our care. 38 of those are pit bull types of dogs, 42%, and that is not uncommon. Berkeley County and Monk's Corner Animal Center is overwhelmed with pit bulls today. Greenwood, Dorchester County, across South Carolina. <clears throat> number two, pit bull type dogs are disproportionately euthanized due to the overwhelming numbers of them. In the survey above that I've mentioned, seven participating animal shelters provided both intake and euthanasia data indicating that nearly half of the dogs put down were pit bull types of dogs. Pit bull types of dogs are the exclusive dog of choice for dog fighting. Pit bull types of dogs cause more severe injuries to South Carolinians than any other dog. This is from our DHEC, our South Carolina DHEC. In 2019, 34 percent, 2,533 of the 7,455, 7,455 identified breeds of dog committing bites were from pit bull types of dogs. Now that eliminates 1,500 dogs that were given the benefit of the doubt because the breed or the type of breed was not known. So there was a recognition that there were dogs that couldn't be placed into the pit bull type of dog category. This legislation addresses four problems, incentivizing spay neuter, relieving significant burdens on animal shelters, reducing the number of dogs available to dog fighting, mitigating the amount of harm caused to humans by fertile pit bull types of dogs, and raising awareness about the plight of these dogs. This is about saving the pit bull type of dog. What this bill is not, which has been mischaracterized quite a bit, this bill is not a ban on pit bull types of dogs. All of us vehemently oppose bans. This is not a mandatory spay neuter. This is not a financial hardship on pit bull types of dogs. If any of you have bought a, bought a bag of dog food um, for $25 or less, you're probably lucky, um, particularly if it's for a large dog. The annual fee, if you choose to breed or not spay neuter your dog, is $25 the cost of a cheap bag of dog food. And it is not a disproportionate burden on any specific demographic group. <clears throat> let, let me say this and be brief because I know we're short on time. Um, our understanding, we work, we work on the lines. Since the onset of the pandemic, we've worked 24 seven. We have never closed our shelter. We don't have the luxury of being out of state and working on political ideologies and philosophies and everything, and I say this out of, um, as politely as I can, it's, um, <clears throat> my understanding is there are three key opponents to this bill, all from out of state. Um, the first one <clears throat> is the AKC out of New York um, with its $100 million budget. Um, the AKC has been exposed over and over again um, for its practices, its, um, um, with the connection to puppy mills, et cetera. This has been done, documented by the Humane Society of the United States, NBC Television, the New York Times, Scientific American, Chicago Tribune, and it goes on and on and on. What I ask you to do is to listen to us, South Carolinians. Another animal organization up in New York, um, the Animal Farm Foundation. Um, the Animal Farm Foundation is suspended 
in South Carolina. Today, it is suspended by our Secretary of Commerce. I see no standing for these two organizations. The AKC does not even recognize Pitbull as a breed of dog. Doesn't run animal shelters, neither does the Animal Farm Foundation. Um, but we thank the um, New York organizations for their so-called expertise. Um, Best Friends Animal Society out in Utah, another $100 million a year organization um, from Utah. Um, I couldn't even tell you what states surround Utah. I don't think most South Carolin Carolinians could, and I don't think most South Carolinians care. Um, but <clears throat> of the animal organizations here, you have a number of these. Um, Aiken, Palm, Palmetto in Columbia, Charleston Animal Society, we all spend well over 80% on programs. Greenwood Humane Society spending nearly 90% on programs. Best friends with this $100 million budget spend a paltry 65% on programs. And that just bare, that is the threshold as minimum spending on programs um, as stated as a standard by the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance for national organizations. All of the others spend more than that. Um, the best friends lobbyist is, or, or representative is on record as saying that this bill is mandatory spay neuter. That is false. It is not. I would be happy to talk to them and to educate our friends from Utah on our bill that um, Representative Huggins, and thank you, Representative Huggins, has introduced in the legislature. I'd be happy to take questions, and, and thank you, Chairman McCravey, for giving me um, this much time. Mr. Elmore, I, I have a lot of questions. Yes, sir. And, and I also sympathize with this, and I'm sure uh, the other representatives have a lot of questions, too, because it's, it's an important topic. Uh, but w if I if I ask you all my questions, we'll be here, and nobody else will be able to testify. And so I'm I'm going to ask you if if it looks like to me we're not even going to get everybody in today. But I want you to come back if you can. If if you can't come in person, maybe appear because the next time we have a hearing on this, I think you need to be here, and, and I think it's important. And uh, I did get a message from Chairman Murphy. I think he's your representative. Yes, sir. And he, he advised me it's a very important issue, and he wanted to thank you for coming today. So we appreciate you coming. So at this time, I know. Uh, thank you, Chairman McCravey. If, if I could, I just want to congratulate um, because um, Greenwood, hum the Humane Society of Greenwood is in your jurisdiction, and we recognize the Humane Society of Greenwood in 2020 as the Animal Shelter of the Year in South Carolina. So I wanted you to know that. Yes, they and work very hard. And congratulations to the folks up there. Um, if I could just say one last thing, is, and, and I'm very concerned about the standing. Um, we have a lot of work on us. The, if the committee members, with all due respect, give preference and standing to us South Carolinians to Jace's mom, to the nine grandchildren of Ethel May Horton in Bishopville. I don't know if our friends in New York and Utah have ever been to Bishopville or Hampton or Greenwood or Monk's Corner or anywhere in South Carolina. But that was 10 years ago. For the sake of our sons of South Carolina, for the sake of our grandmothers of South Carolina, let's not go another 10 years without action. And thank you, Chairman McCravey, very much for giving me that. Please. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate right, it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next witness we have is uh, Victoria Labar. Ms. Labar, we want to thank you for coming today. And we know it's very difficult for you. And, uh, and we appreciate you coming. Thank you for having me. So you know my name. I'm 23. In January 20th of this year, I lost my son to a stray pit bull that showed up on my property. Um, he was not fixed. I reported him to the local animal shelter, as I would do if my dog got out, because I have my own animals, and I am not rich. I, but my animals are chipped. They have tags with my name and my address. And if they got out, I know I would call the proper people to let them know that they got out as a responsible pet owner. And the bottom line is a phone call 
could have saved my son's life if whoever had owned that dog had just called and reported them missing. And how he, it just, in less than three seconds, my life changed. Eight days the dog was with us and he showed no signs of anything until he just walked up to my son and ripped out his throat. And it, I don't blame the dog. I've taken in many pit bulls. In hindsight, it's always 2020. So yes, now I would go back and not keep that dog. But I wouldn't have done anything different in the beginning. I would have still fed that dog. I still would have notified animal control. And I still would have tried to have found him a home. Because there are options just for, like there is safe haven options for babies. There are options for animals other than abandoning what should be a member of your family on the side of the road. And that's what my pets are to me. My dog that day fought to save my son's life, even though she was half the size of the dog that took his. And if these laws have been in effect, just maybe my son would be alive today. And if they, they my, nothing will bring my son back. But if my son and a dog died that day and neither one had to happen. And that's, that's really it. It was something that was completely avoidable if whoever had owned that dog had been responsible. I am only 23, but my dog is family. And if she got out, I definitely would be out looking for her, no, looking on social media, because I posted all over social media trying to locate his owner. I even talked with people who thought maybe he was theirs, and he wasn't. And I had found him a home. And the day the man was supposed to come get him, he walked up to my son, showed no signs of aggression, and went straight for his throat. And in less than three seconds, me and my family's life was turned upside down. And still, we have no idea who the dog belongs to. We can find no vet records for his rabies vaccines. He had no microchips, and he was not fixed. Uh, uh, that's, I think that's it. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Labar, we're very sorry for your loss, and we can't imagine what it would be like to go through that. And so we want to thank you for your courage to come and testify today. We have next uh, Tallulah McGee. We're going to try to get uh, this witness in and, and Barbara Nelson, but we're going to have to do it in less than five minutes. So if we can try to get it done. I tend to talk quick. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Tallulah McGee. I'm director of Animal Control in Beaufort County since 2012. In 2012, we began a reduced program within Beaufort County. And of course, the main focus was the pit bull population. You have heard the data pertain to pit bulls, but I wanted to explain the way Beaufort County and our partner, Hilton Head Humane, attacked the problem. Hilton Head Humane and Beaufort County knew the only way to reduce euthanasia cost and intake was aggressive spay-neuter. In 2015, we passed the ordinance of mandatory spay-neuter of all pit bulls and pit bull mixes. We are not ones who would create laws unless we have a plan to make it work. Hilton Head Humane offered free spay-neuter to all pit and pit bull mixes within the county. 
The ability to enforce was cost effective because of our fix it or ticket campaign. We eliminated the need to enforce through the courts, but administrative tickets. It's almost like a parking ticket, which I have samples here if y'all would like to see them. Um, sorry, let me see this. Buford County saw a dramatic increase in the number of pit bulls spayed and neutered. The number of pit bulls sterilized increased over 100% just 18 months after we passed this ordinance. Um, I'm here to support any law to help reduce a population that's out of balance, but hope in the future you listen to those who are in the field that we need to focus on higher penalties to those who create the problem. The time and effort to collect $25 for those who are the problem is far too low and not cost effective, but again, it's a step in the right direction. So please support this law. Um, we hope that in the future, we need to be aggressive and hope that administrative tickets would be an enforcement throughout the state because the revenue to pay for free sterilization would be from the people who are the problem and not the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you questions? for your testimony. Any questions? Okay, and probably our last witness of the day is going to be Barbara Nelson from the SPCA in Aiken, South Carolina. Aiken, South Carolina, that's correct. All right, my name is Barbara Nelson. Uh, thank you, Chairman McCravey, for the opportunity. Um, yes, this is the SBCA Albrecht Center in Aiken, South Carolina. We are not associated with the national organization, the ASPCA. We are local, on-the-ground, nonprofit animal shelter in Aiken, South Carolina. I think that you have heard that irresponsible pet uh, owners are um, really causing a lot of trouble here in South Carolina. And responsibility means that if you're not going to be in the business of breeding to promote the breed, then you should be spaying and neutering and microchipping your pet. Uh, the bill that you're considering today is a very simple solution to an important issue that affects the safety and the well-being, not only of human beings, but of the, of the animal itself. Uh, the mix of dogs that we're talking about here has historically been bred to have extremely strong jaws and do not let go of their victim. They are the breed of choice for drug dealers and others who post them as alarms in protection against law enforcement. They have found their way into the general population of dogs, and that's extremely unfortunate. There are some very nice little pit bulls out there, but they're a lot different than these ones that you're seeing when you're finding them across the country here in South Carolina. They are the most abused, they are the hardest to adopt, and they are the most euthanized. They are by far the largest percent of the dogs in shelters. As Tallulah mentioned to you, a registration ordinance does work. For example, in the city of Aiken, we passed a modest registration fee in 2005. The AKC, a national organization that does not even recognize the breed of pit bulls, or so-called breed of pit bulls, this mix, opposed that ordinance that we had. In that ordinance, what we do in the city of Aiken in 2005 is we said that any fertile dog must, the owner must pay $100. It was a lifetime fee, $100. Anyone that had a spayed and neutered dog, no charge whatsoever. It worked extremely well. In 2005, there were 625 dogs, that, 635 dogs that were brought to the SBCA Albrecht Center. In 2020, the number was reduced by two-thirds to 217. Registration ordinances for fertile dogs work. They absolutely work. We had no pushback from the citizens. They completely understood it. The only pushback we had was from AKC. They told me it wouldn't work. They told city council it wouldn't work. Fortunately, city council was progressive enough. They passed the ordinance, and you can see that it worked. I urge you to consider the experiences in the city of Aiken. Understand that these dogs have a propensity to turn like that if they're fertile because they're aggressive, have a tendency to be aggressive, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions about the city of Aiken's simple registration system, its database, and its effectiveness. It does work. I urge you to highly consider this bill. Thank you very much. We want to thank you for your testimony. I think Representative Huggins has a quick question. No, sir, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say thank you, number one, for everyone that's come today. I have a couple of folks I'd just like to recognize because I know they're not going to get to testify today. We have Mr. Loris Mungo, if you would please stand, and Denise Wilkerson in the back. They are both from Palmetto Lifeline. 
I cannot tell you what they do. It's so important to all of our state and community, and we appreciate y'all being here very much today as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we do want to recognize you and thank you for coming today. Uh, we're going to have to continue this because we're out of time. and.